Hello everyone, we're going to continue learning about how evolution works, and to do that today we're going to look at the interactions of organisms as they compete to eat. Let's jump right in. Everyone was introduced to the concept of a food web in school. We're taught that there are producers and consumers. The producers are autotrophic organisms, such as plants, meaning they make their own food. In the end, plants produce glucose through the process of photosynthesis, making them photoautotrophs. Not all autotrophs use photosynthesis, though. Some are chemoautotrophs, such as some bacteria and archaea, meaning they utilize hydrogen sulfide, sulfur, ferrous iron, hydrogen, and ammonia. Anyway, primary producers are autotrophs, and they are consumed by herbivorous primary consumers. The herbivores are then consumed by carnivores, whether primary, secondary, tertiary, etc. Now, all the different organisms in the food web have adaptations dependent on their place in it. Carnivores often have weaponry evolved for capturing prey, including claws, sharp teeth, venom, and sometimes even complex hunting strategies, both individual and cooperative. Teeth specifically can tell us a whole lot about an organism, and in mammalogy, these are possibly the most important anatomical structures. At LSU, I interned at the Museum of Zoology in the Department of Mammalogy, and the professor I worked for discovered a species of shrew rat he named Posidentomys vermidax, meaning few-toothed shrew rat and earthworm eater. This shrew rat evolved away its molars because it specialized entirely on a diet of earthworms. That is, the only teeth it has are incisors. How strange is that? In response to the carnivores, many herbivores have also evolved their own defenses. For example, many herbivores have evolved tail weaponry. Sauropods had long, whip-like tails. Ankylosaurs and glyptodonts had massive clubs. Stegosaurus had spiky thagomizers, and even Miolanid turtles had tough osteoderms. Fun fact, there's a species of Miolanid turtle named Ninjames, and the etymology of its name is described thusly. Quote, Ninja, in allusion to that totally rad, fearsome, foursome, epitomizing shelled success. Emmys, turtle. Yes, it's named for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Never let it be said that scientists don't have a sense of humor. Other herbivores have long legs that allow them to run quickly, such as horses and gazelles. In response, some predators have similarly developed mechanisms for running at high speeds, such as the cheetah. In North America, there was a species of cougar called Myrosynonyx that independently evolved to look cheetah-like, and it hunted pronghorns. Pronghorns are so fast because they had to compete for survival with Myrosynonyx. However, even though Myrosynonyx went extinct a few thousand years ago, pronghorns still have their speed as a leftover of those earlier days, making them evolutionary anachronisms. Now, predators that hunt prey have to be able to catch prey. Otherwise, obviously the predators die. Prey that can evade predators better than those who can't are more likely to survive. That makes sense. Predators then are likely to develop mechanisms by which to get around the prey's defenses. Then the prey is likely to adapt to continue to avoid the predators, and round and round the cycle goes. This is called an evolutionary arms race. It occurs between murex, snails, and crabs, arctidae moths and bats, rough-skinned newts and garter snakes, and many, many other organisms. For the first, crabs have evolved strong claws to cope with the snail's thick shell and spines. For the second, the Arctidae moths are sensitive to the ultrasonic frequencies emitted by bats, so Barbastella bats use frequencies with very low amplitudes to catch the moths. For the third, the garter snakes have repeatedly developed mutations to eat the rough skin newts without being harmed by their poison. Evolutionary arms races have even been proposed as the reason that so many fossils appear at the start of the Cambrian. The idea is that something provoked the origination of large predators, such as Anomalocaris, which prompted their prey to develop defenses, including tough exoskeletons, that solidified them in the fossil record. 
In the case of predators that chase their prey across the savanna, for instance, why is there a speed limit? Why can't both the predators and prey keep adapting faster and faster speeds ad infinitum? The reason is that all adaptations are limited by the luck of the genetic draw that generated their underlying mutations, but also by the environment, internal and external. That's why, for example, many animals get smaller on islands, as we saw in paleogeography. Similarly, producers also often compete with herbivores. Acacia trees, say, have large spikes to keep giraffes at bay, while the North American honey locust tree spikes deterred the browsing mastodon. And what about parasites? Well, they go through arms races with their hosts in precisely the same way that herbivores and carnivores compete. For example, cuckoos are known as brood parasites because they lay their eggs in the nests of other birds, leaving those birds to tend for the cuckoo's hatchlings. Some birds that are parasitized by cuckoos have evolved defenses against them. In this context, it's beneficial to be able to differentiate your eggs from someone else's. So birds that are able to accomplish that have a decreased chance of being parasitized. It's no coincidence then that brood parasitism tends not to show up in bird species that nest in vast flocks where parents have evolved to be able to find their own chicks reliably in the vast crowd. And, one bird species has even been taught to spot brood parasites better by counting their eggs more often. Thus, you see that the interrelationships among predators, prey, and parasites can drive evolution, even experimentally. These relationships can cause all sorts of adaptive defenses to develop as organisms attempt to pass on their genes to future generations. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.